Before you say it, I know we tend to look back on the past through rose-tinted spectacles. So I am actually aware that I need to be careful here. I am also aware that I may just be a grumpy and out-of-touch old man. And yes, there are things that are better than 30 years ago. For example, YouTube. I couldn't have done this when I was younger. I couldn't be speaking to you like this. But I think life was generally better 30 years ago. And I'm going to give you my top six reasons why. Movies and cinema was better. In the 80s and 90s, it was one stellar movie release after another. And going to the cinema was an event. There was a palpable sense of excitement and anticipation. Just the sight of the ice cream lady stood in the dimly lit aisles raised excitement. And we always had an intermission. More ice cream. And the blockbusters kept us coming back again and again and again. 48 hours, Back to the Future, Spinal Tap, American Werewolf in London, Die Hard, The Three Amigos, Ferry Spuler's Day Off, Wayne's World, Titanic, Pulp Fiction, There's not enough tape in the camera for me to mention them all. 30 to 40 years ago, we experienced these blockbusters in huge theatres. Like this one, packed to the rafters. You could almost taste the atmosphere and tension. This one's now a pub. Movies of today rely heavily on CGI and computer effects. They've totally forgotten about the humour, the story, the romance. I've just looked at a list of the top movies of 2022. All of them instantly forgettable. And there's too many remakes, too many sequels. If you do get around to dragging yourself to the pictures these days, you'll end up in one of these godforsaken places. Two tickets, your Coke, two boxes of popcorn are going to set you back about £70. You'll be sat in a characterless box of about 100 seats and you'll share the movie with, if you're lucky, another seven people. That creates all the atmosphere of a morgue. Going to the pictures was much better 30 years ago. Music was better. What's the number one single this week? Go on, tell me without googling it. Put it in the comments. What was your favourite song that was released last month? Okay, okay, let me make this easier. What's your top three favourite songs that have been released in the last six months? If you can't answer those questions, then you're not alone. The music charts are filled with anodyne, relentless drivel. Yes, there are some exceptions, but not many. Those exceptions are so rare that they make an inordinate amount of money because they're operating in a vacuum. I like Ed Sheeran. He's great. Is he on the level of Elvis, Sinatra, U2, The Beatles, Oasis, Queen, Michael Jackson? No, he isn't. But I saw a report recently that he'd made $200 million in his first 10 years in the business. Of course he has. He's operating in a vacuum with no competition. The Shape of You. It's a great little song. But it's not Imagine or Bohemian Rhapsody, is it? But it's the second most streamed song in the world. It's been streamed three and a half billion times on Spotify, and it's been seen six billion times on YouTube. In the 80s, it would have spent a couple of weeks at number one, and then something else would come along pretty quickly to take its crown. And then it would be viewed as just another great song. And yes, I know it's the job of the older generation to not get the contemporary music of the day. I get it. But come on! Where is it? If you've heard one of them, you've heard them all. There's no originality and no standout bands. Where's the next Stones? Beatles, Stevie Wonder, David Bowie. Where are the rock bands? I'll tell you where they are. They're nowhere. I didn't put Elvis on that list because there'll never be another one of him. What have we got instead? Miley Cyrus, Adele, Justin Bieber, Taylor Swift. They're all great artists, but 30 or 40 years ago, they'd have been B-list. If any song remotely good comes along, it rockets up the charts and stays there for three months for six months, maybe even a year. It's so rare to hear a good song, it hangs around because there's nothing to replace it. Taylor Swift recently launched her album Midnight. Individual tracks from it instantly took over all top 10 spots on the US Hot 100 chart. All top 10, and they stayed there. Think about that for a moment. Okay, it was a great album. Well done, Taylor Swift. But the fact that every spot in the top 10 was hijacked tells me that there was nothing there competing with it. In the 80s and 90s, chart battles were a constant fact of life. We were overwhelmed with quality and diversity, and only the very best got anywhere near the top 10. Here's a challenge for you. Turn off YouTube now, find a pen and a piece of paper, and write down a song. Get your next-door neighbour to sing it and release it on Spotify. It's actually got a good chance of charting somewhere. Music was much better 30 years ago. Starting work was better. I got my first proper job in 1987. It was in a bank and it was a poorly paid junior position. And I got to do all manner of ghastly tasks 
that were in no way enjoyable. This was the same for many people my age. But we got a foot in the door and a contract. It basically said that you now work here for 35 hours a week for terrible money, unless you do something really bad, in which case we'll fire you. The work was rubbish and you really couldn't live on the money. But there was a bit of security there. And I knew where the next paycheck was coming from. And I could see a career ladder and how to better myself. And I had an instant friend network handy to me on a plate. A social life was given to me and I thrived off it. By 19, I'd left home and by 22, I'd bought my first house. Today, a young person has two options. They can go to university, work their socks off for three years, only to find that it doesn't really help them to get the job they want. Or they can go straight into the workplace, often on a contract where just five to 10 hours are guaranteed every week. Or worse, through an agency where no hours are guaranteed at all. They're working from week to week. Today, a young person has got no chance to develop their social life because they're hopping from job to job, trying to get a career started. They quite often have zero security of a monthly wage because their contract has been written by somebody who is looking at this week's profits, not the long-term future of the company or the young person. If they do get a job they want, quite often they'll be working from home on a laptop. They're not developing their social skills and they're not getting out into the world to see what it's got to offer them. Young people starting out in work today have got it bad and it's not their fault. Maybe that's why they're still at home when they're 30 with little or no prospect of buying their first home. Starting work as a young person was much better 30 years ago. banks were better. Back in the 1980s, Britain was served by 20,000 bank branches. You went there for your transactions, advice, support, help, guidance, investments, debt advice, and to start up and run your business. Bank branches were the pillars upon which the community thrived. But they're disappearing. Now, I get it. There's more ways to bank now. There's telephone banking, mobile banking, online banking, and your app. We don't need as many physical branches as we once did. I agree with that, but we've gone too far. We're sleepwalking our way to a bankless society. Today, there's just 5,000 bank branches in the whole of Britain, and that number is shrinking fast. Since 2015, branch closures have been rapid. It's the same in the United States. In the past, we've seen small sites close, but it hasn't really mattered because there's another branch down the road with plenty of staff there, little bit of inconvenience, but now large branches are closing. If you want to visit your bank to sort out a problem, to get advice, to apply for a mortgage, to do anything face-to-face, -face, you'll have a very long journey. And you can't just turn up. Expect to book an appointment many weeks in advance. Want advice about starting a business? Banks used to fall over themselves to vie for your business. Now, you'll be sent a link to provide some details. If anything face-to-face -face needs to happen, they'll give you an appointment for the end of next month. And that'll probably be on Zoom with somebody at home, dressed from the waist up. Online banking is transitioning from a fantastically convenient way to do transactional banking to the only way to do your banking. I've had a career in banking, which is probably why I'm quite passionate about the subject. I've seen the difference that banks can make to people's lives. Yes, they mess up from time to time, and it is a national pastime to criticise them. But banks are generally a force for good. Banks provide the oxygen for healthy business and community. Banking can't be condensed down to an app. At its best, it's a very special relationship between the customer and the banker. You do well, the bank does well. It's a win-win relationship. And it's a people business. Most people don't know what they want or need when it comes to money. They don't know the right questions to ask. That's where a relationship with a banker comes in and not on an app. In the UK and in many places around the world, your bank is seen as a part of you. It's part of your identity. People have an emotional attachment to their bank and they covet it. Banking is heading towards a place where all their wonderful staff, and they are wonderful, are housed in huge out-of-town office suites where no customers are allowed, whilst the customer must contend with apps, links, phone calls and misery. A banker today, sadly, spends his time facing a laptop and not a customer. And he's probably doing it from home in his pyjamas. Don't get me started on home working. Banks have forgotten how they got so big in the first place. They grew out of communities and now they're abandoning them because they found a cheaper way to do business. Money management is easier today and it's more convenient, but banking was much better 30 years ago. Happiness levels were better. We were happier 30 years ago. People today rely far too much on their phones and it makes us less sociable as a society. It makes us introspective. People don't live in the now. Something good happens, where's my phone? Something bad happens, where's my phone? When I was younger, people did seem happier. Now we're all bogged down with the weight of social media and phone usage. We seem to think that everyone we see online has got a better life than we do. When in truth, they're probably deeply unhappy. They get a dopamine hit every time a friend clicks like on their picture and you're left miserable because you think that they've got a better life than you do. So you pep yourself up by taking a photograph of a particularly yummy dessert that you've just rustled yourself up and that in turn 
makes somebody that you haven't seen for seven years jealous of your internal decor. Then we've got ever-decreasing circles. Look at photos and video of people 30, 40 years ago. People lived in the moment and enjoyed themselves. People conversed, they flirted, they laughed. They were less concerned about their appearance and more concerned about having a laugh and a good time. If something awesome happened, you lived it. There was no phone to whip out and spoil the moment. Work didn't follow you home and problems at home didn't follow you to work. They couldn't. There were better social structures before we all became digitized. The phrase mental health honestly did not reach my ears until about 10 years ago. Now everything's a mental health issue. Everything is analyzed and dissected these days. Young people have their heads filled with it. Every bad thing that happens in the world is distilled into instant information that's beamed to your phone. And that's either from the news or social media. We're drip fed horror stories and bad vibes relentlessly every day. Whereas 30 years ago, we were blissfully unaware of the bad stuff and we just got on with our day. I wish I was making this up, but generally, yes, people were happier 30 years ago. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. Buying a house was better and buying a house was easier. A 5% deposit, a good credit score, tidy bank account, a regular wage was all you needed. Property prices are now five times higher than 30 years ago, but wages aren't five times higher. Deposits are often a minimum of 10%. Young people and renters are now faced with having to find a deposit of 10 to 20,000 pounds before even thinking about the cheapest houses, flats or apartments. People aren't getting onto the housing ladder until their mid thirties, if at all. Young people are staying much longer with their parents and they're missing out so much in life. The birth rate is plummeting now in Western society. Most households can't manage on just one wage. Whereas 30 or 40 years ago, it was the norm. Renters have got absolutely no chance of getting together the required deposit for a mortgage. And young people living at home face years of scrimping and scraping, only to be declined a mortgage because they missed a mobile phone payment six months ago. You can't even have a chat with your friendly neighborhood mortgage advisor anymore. Even if the bank's open, they'll pre-screen you to make sure that you've hit the criteria for an application. They're not gonna waste time just giving you advice for the future. Buying a house was much easier 30 years ago. I know there's loads of great things about modern life. I couldn't have spoken to you like this on YouTube 30 years ago. We've got a lot to be thankful for, but I do think life was better 30 years ago. Do you agree with me? Or am I just a bitter and twisted old man? Tell me what you think in the comments.